We know your boys mm -hmm. in ways you don't know your boys. And you need to listen to us when we tell you that we know them. We know them when you're not around. I went to a friend of police straight away. I, I said, I know this, doesn't, this isn't right. I feel violated, but I also thought, is this something that they'll take serious? Because mm -hmm. they just groped my, my breasts, but probably you know, just, if you'd had a night out as well. Yeah, and the fact that I had to think like that. I'm really interested in how do we actually push further into men, I'm not saying have a breakdown, but have a breakthrough. I think people don't often know what sexism is. I think we can really simplify it by thinking about it as, would this person be experiencing that if they were male? If the answer is no, it's sexism. If they are made to feel vulnerable or patronized or like reduced to less than they are, if their safety is compromised, it's sexism. But if someone can't tell the difference between their flirting or kindness and sexual harassment, they need to stop the whatever they're doing. Welcome to this Politics Joe special, a panel discussion hoping to answer some of the questions provoked by events in recent weeks. Should street harassment be criminalised? Is hashtag not all men an appropriate response to the death of Sarah Everard? And what can men do practically to make women feel safer? I'm Jess Davis and I'll be moderating this evening. Joining me on the panel is journalist Miriam Francois, curator and writer Alia Hasina, and marketing manager, Maxine Heron. So how's everyone doing this evening? Good, thank you. Hey. How are you? Yeah. I'm good, thanks. <laughs> how's everyone feeling? I know it's been a kind of tough couple of weeks for us women, hasn't it? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Where do we start? Yeah. Where do we start? It just keeps coming, doesn't it? Mm. Um, but I saw, yeah. I saw someone point out recently that in the same week we had uh, Meghan Markle's interview and then news was surfacing about Sarah Everard and then we had, I believe we had International Women's Day as well in the same week, then we had Mother's Day. It was such an intense week yeah. for so many women. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's been a lot. Mm, I know, definitely. So I know we've got plenty to chat about, um, but starting off with street harassment. I know in the past couple of weeks, a lot of women have bravely spoken out about being victims of sexual harassment in the street. And it kind of is safe to say that street harassment is probably an everyday experience for a lot of women. So do you feel that perhaps criminalising sexual harassment in the street might help solve the problem? Is that to me? <laughs> to to you you want to start? <laughs> um, I mean, I personally uh, feel that legal solutions are not always the best solutions. That actually what we need is a cultural shift when it comes to respect for women's autonomy in public spaces and women's autonomy in general. Um, and so I'd much rather see um, uh, a sort of efforts that are both, you know, from both sides um, to bring in the idea that when we're in the street, if you do see somebody harassing somebody else, that it is perfectly legitimate to stand up and say something, you know, back off, back down. And I can give very concrete examples of my day-to-day -day life where, you know, I was recently, like, during the summer, out riding a bike with my son on the street, and I got followed, I got tailed, basically, by a guy in a car for a good 10 minutes. And, you know, not only was this situation dangerous for myself, it was dangerous for my son, it was also problematic in terms of the behaviour that was being absorbed by my son, in terms of him looking at this dynamic and absorbing that you know, I'm as his mum trying to keep him calm. So I'm trying to act like this is a normal situation, but it isn't a normal situation. But to his eyes, it will appear that this man harassing me is something that I'm kind of being okay with because I don't want to panic my child. This happened for long enough that there were people walking by in cars that would have been seeing what was happening. I felt that any man in that situation walking by because I know that that man would not have listened, clearly wasn't listening to me. I don't think he would listen to another woman. Another man should just, just uh, move on, move on, leave her alone. Like there's just, it's really, it takes two seconds, mm -hmm. takes two seconds. But instead I was left in what felt like a very vulnerable situation without feeling like there was any backup. And when you don't feel like there's backup, you feel like there's complicity actually. Mm. So what did you do in that situation? How did you handle that? So I'm not, 
Honestly, I don't know if I handled it well. I tried to stay very calm, um, principally because I could tell that my son was getting very concerned by what was happening. So I could see him looking over and he was saying, mommy, like, what's going on? Is he, are you okay? What's happening? Why is this man talking to you? Like, why is he shouting at you from the window? Um, and I didn't want him to panic. We're on a main road. Um, so I basically turned left. At the first left I could find, I turned left. The guy followed me down that road. Um, and so at that point, I turned to him and I just said, you know, can you just leave us alone? But I'm still trying to stay really calm. And, you know, in many ways, he, I was hoping that he would not detect that I was either panicked or scared, which I think sometimes may be part of the issue because a lot of people who harass you, I think, thrive off making you feel scared. Like there's something about that power dynamic, which is like a little kick for them. So for me as a woman, I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear how you ladies feel about it. But for me, a part of my response is like, I'm not gonna let you show, I'm not gonna show you for a second that you're scaring me. But at the same time, when you don't show any vulnerability, maybe to the people around you, it doesn't look like you need help. Mm. And so I can understand that for bystanders, it might be confusing. And I suppose what I'm trying to say is, if you are seeing a situation like that, even if it looks like she's got it under control, it might worth be worth just saying, are you okay? Would you like me to say something? Or just saying something. And I understand sometimes there might be women who will say, I had it, don't, you know, but it's still better to check. Um, so I don't know if I handled it well because I don't know that I sent a good signal to my son in terms of what he learned. Maybe he learned that it looked completely normal to tell a woman even though she's telling you constantly to leave her alone um, but I also had to fight to retain my dignity in that situation and part of my dignity isn't allowing myself to to panic and freak out and, and make myself into a victim when I mm. am a fighter absolutely yeah mm. I completely agree and I think what I found so interesting about what you said Miriam is the cultural shift. Mm. How do we create a culture that values women, that actually views them as human because I think a lot of what we're seeing is the idea that women aren't human or aren't acceptable in the same way that men are and I guess that's what misogyny or patriarchy is, it's the privileging of a masculine energy over a feminine energy and seeing one as strength and one as weakness when really there is both within both and so when we start to have those conversations what does it look like for us to change our culture like the lad culture that we have in this country for example the enabling culture the rape culture that we have in this country but also how do we make sure it's intersectional how do we make sure that it takes from not just white women but black women queer women lgbtqia women like so many other women who aren't necessarily represented in these conversations um, because it has to be through that lens otherwise it will continue to just do the same thing that white feminism has in terms of not supporting and just trying to get white women on par with um, white men in work situations and we we can see that that isn't helping that hasn't worked so far so how do we move forward in a way that is more inclusive but also a lot more stringent because exactly like you said, I, every woman I know past the age of probably 14 has the experience of being harassed, raped, or um, like assaulted by men because they are women. And that's 100% of the women that I know. And like, I'm even just like seething a little bit now because it's just <clears throat> like, when will it stop? I'm so with you. When we um, got into this conversation, I was thinking about the women around me and I was like, why do I know so many women? Mm. I know, I know mm. women who've been gang raped. Mm -hmm. I know women who've been drugged and raped. I know women who've been sexually assaulted. I've been assaulted. Like, mm. why? why? Why is this something that we have to still insist on mm. and that is still perceived as like, oh, it's just, you know, a rare occurrence. In your world, it's a rare occurrence. In our world, mm -hmm. it's very, very very common mm -hmm. and the fact that women are blamed for it as well I find so bizarre yeah why so, were you wearing that why were you wearing that but yeah. it actually why doesn't matter so it makes no sense because I know women who wear hijabs or barb in the car but you can only see their eyes and they're still harassed on the street there's the identification that you are a woman and so therefore you are an easy target and that's what I believe really needs to shift and for us to change otherwise 
I, I just don't know how do we raise like younger children, boys and girls, yeah. to like humanise women. I agree with everything that you both just said completely. Um, I think going back to the question about whether or not it should be illegal to harass women in the street, mm. it is about sorting the attitude from within. It shouldn't take criminalising something for people to stop. It should take them knowing that it's wrong for them to not even do it in the first place. It's not about getting caught. It's about knowing that you should not be perpetuating this behaviour, knowing that you need to be treating people how you want to be treated, and that's regardless of anyone's gender. It's, yeah, it's something that we're all quite sick of at this point. And it's interesting with the recent events, it's been kind of the catalyst of all these discussions. Um, and I think the reason that we're all collectively so angry is because we realise we've all been dealing with so many of the same issues and being silent about them, and we don't want to be silent anymore. We're just, this is our chance to really mm. hopefully change things so that less things can happen like that, so that no more women have to die at the hands of a man. Because it doesn't start there, it starts with so many other red flag behaviours. It starts with harassment, it starts with misogyny, it starts with perpetuating rape culture, it starts with um, not taking no for an answer, when actually the t first time someone says no, it's a no. When in fact, if someone says no halfway through your encounter with them, it's still a no. Um, there are just so many different problems that we have and I don't think necessarily bringing in a law would solve it. I think it would be nice to have that on side. I think it would be a bonus. But these conversations need to be had by men who don't necessarily feel like they're the problem um, because they may not be actively raping people, but in staying silent, they are allowing people around them men that they probably care about as well, who they don't want to turn into horrible people. They're allowing, they're allowing them to take on those behaviours, which over the time snowball into something that's worse and worse and worse, and is at the detriment of all women. Absolutely. And I guess looking at street harassment being criminalised, we have to look at whether we can actually put trust in the police to follow up with this kind of, effectively, what would be classed as perhaps low-level sexual assault when it's harassment in the street. Personally, I had an experience um, where I was followed by two men at, at night, after a night out, I was groped um, and they followed me until I got in my taxi and managed to shut the door. I went to a friend of police straight away. I, I said, I know this, doesn't, this isn't right. I feel violated, but I also thought, is this something that they'll take serious? Because mm -hmm. They just groped to my, my breasts, but you know, just, if you'd had a night out as well. Yeah, and the fact that I had to think like that, it took um, three police stations, four days of me constantly phoning for someone to actually take my statement. They actually somehow managed to find my friend's contact number who had been out with me that evening and phoned her first um, before actually getting back in touch with me and taking my statement and uh, kind of laughed it off to her and said, well, I guess Jess might be telling the truth considering she keeps trying to phone us back. And um, also said we probably wouldn't waste money looking, looking at that because it's quite a low level crime. Mm. To me, I felt I've been violated, I've been, I've been groped. So it, it's like, where, where do we turn when we, can't, when we can't turn to the police to report these kind of crimes? And also the um, suggestion that we now, you know, one of the solutions being um, floated was what, undercover police officers? I hate that in idea. Ba in bars? <laughs> Absolutely not. Creepy men <laughs> following you around in bars, like, oh yeah, I've got a police officer badge, it's fine. Like, no, we don't, this is not a solution that was developed in any way in consultation with women. It can't possibly have been mm. at all. Yeah, there's all black women at <laughs> all so that just makes no sense and particularly for um, black women in communities we're killed at the hands of the police continually and there's no conversation around that at all we're killed and kidnapped and abused at completely different rates because the level of dehumanization is an additional racialized one so to even bring a hint of having the police in this space is absolutely absurd and actually could cause a lot more harm than good at all because mm. race relations between the police are notoriously horrendous. Um, I think it's a complete waste of resources as well. I think there are so many other ways that we can help you know, end actual crimes. Maybe they can put it towards people who are actually trafficking women, mm. um, things like that. I don't think we need to be having undercover cops in nightclubs which are mm. pretty much safe spaces I consider for people to be doing what they want and just out without having to worry about a policeman next to them. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly in light of what's happened recently, it feels like it, a suggestion that's really missed the mark. Um, as we know, the main suspect in the death of Sarah Everard is a policeman who was not wearing his uniform when she went missing. And 
to suggest that the solution is more men who are policemen not in their uniforms is a solution is just it's baffling to me mm -hmm. and i think if you've ever been in situations where the police have been harassers which depending on what countries you live in or have yeah. lived in that does happen um then you're perception of the police is a protective force like you said for black women but i think you know there are just certain countries where particularly for working class communities mm. <laughs> the view of the police is um you know i've seen police officers in france grope women in st stop and search um you know and it's it's blatant so i mean there's just yeah that for me is never it but i did want to raise something what i'd love to hear what everyone else thinks but I think some men get confused about, you know, is it street harassment if you see a beautiful woman walk down the street? Because every single one of us here, when we walk down the street in summer and we're looking fly and we know that we are, sure, we, we know we look good and we're, we're quite happy to look good. And that's, that's, you know, we take full responsibility for that. Is there a line between someone saying, you know, I just want to say you look amazing, which a woman can do as well, right? Sometimes you want to meet occasionally an amazing sister who will just be like, wow, just you look like you look so hot today. You look amazing. And you're just like, yeah, cool. That, I, I can take that. There's a big difference between that and howling at us yeah. from the side of your car with three of your mates in the back. There's a big difference between that coming up to someone and just saying, I just want to say you look incredible. Have a beautiful day. And following us and shouting obscenities at us mm. from behind or as as happened to me like the other day i was walking out to get milk and some guy just as i was walking past him just in my ear was just like lent in to shout obscenities like what what is that what is what are you going for with that did mm. you think i was going to turn around and be like oh that sounds amazing let's do that i think that if someone can't tell the difference between their flirting or kindness and sexual harassment they need to stop the whatever they're doing yeah absolutely and i think that's something that a lot of men perhaps have felt a bit attacked about saying yeah. well you know what i can't even come up to you in the street now and say that you look good or anything like that but it's like, I feel like there's a personal responsibility of what's the intent behind it, you know, and where, where do you want to go with that? Mm. So I guess that leads us on a lot to the conversation that has been trending a lot, the hashtag not all men on Twitter this week. And a lot of men do feel like it's unfair to speak about men as a collective when we're speaking about male violence against women. Do you think it's unfair that we're talking about men as a collective when talking about the sexual harassment, abuse, and assault towards women by men. Alia, all men, all, all men matter. All men matter. All men matter. It's basically all lives matter all over again. Mm. Um, it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Um, and I think anyone who does bring that up acknowledges that there's something that they may have done wrong, and then there's a sense of shame or guilt in that. I think for the men who understand what's happening um they'll sort of be like okay but i'm not part of that harassment cohort so i'm not going to be offended by it being choosing to be offended by it is a very interesting indication for me personally of complicity in that culture in that way of being um it also reminds me of when the term men are trash was everywhere and men would get really offended by it. And I think something that was underneath all of that was the fact that men are hyper-emotional human beings. I know that we always get told that we're hyper-emotional human beings, but I often say this a lot, men and women are the same emotionally, we're just socialized in very different ways. And that leads to repression anger and um, so many different negative emotions being stifled within men. So that when there's one sense of this is a bigger dialogue or this is a conversation to be had, it feels like an attack because you haven't been able to let out those emotions or talk about them constructively. And so I'm really interested in how do we actually push further into men, I'm not saying have a breakdown, but have a breakthrough, like have a look at what feels like it's burning within you? What feels shameful? What do you fear? How do we move forward from those spaces? Because nothing can change unless someone has the will to change and actually wants to correct their behaviors. Otherwise, we'll see not all men. We'll see not all men. And like, frankly, we're tired. <laughs>
so like men who aren't adopting those behaviors also must be tired but for us to say oh actually no it's not all men it's lazy I think they kind of miss what we're saying as well, exactly. because what we're, what, we're, what we're saying is not that every single man is a rapist. We're aware that not all men are rapists, and it would be unfair to claim that all men are rapists or murderers. It would be completely untrue. But um, it's enough men that it's a concern, mm -hmm. and it's a responsibility that all men have to solve this. And that's what we're saying. It's a situation that all men need to contribute to the change of, because whatever we're doing at the moment is not working. So. People need to step up, step up to the plate a bit, I think. I think there's also the fact that three women a week are killed at the hands of a male partner, and that isn't a reciprocal statistic. So it actually means that people are not alive anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that needs to be analysed a little bit more and not just be like, not all men, not all men, because women are dying, guys. Yeah. yeah. Women are dying. <clears throat> and that's it. And it's the not all men argument, for me, is just another way to try and shift the conversation away from what is actually going on mm. and it's like no not all men commit these crimes we know that but all men do reap the benefits of living in a patriarchal society that sees women as the inferior gender the inferior sex mm. so it's like are all men doing enough to change that and if you're not doing enough to change that why not because if you're angry and you're angry at being tarnished with this brush, then, then do something about it. It's as simple as that. Absolutely. But for one of the main problems I have with the not all men hashtag is that we know your boys mm -hmm. in ways you don't know your boys. And you need to listen to us when we tell you that we know them. We know them when you're not around. Yeah. We know them in spaces where they can be other than the face that they show you. And all of us, I'm sure, have experienced that in some way. And it's, for me, a very personal issue because I have been in situations where somebody that was, um, you know, a part of a childhood group of friends um, took advantage of me and I found that when I spoke to my male friends about that person there was a lot of denial there was a lot of you know but he's a good guy and I was like to you mm -hmm. to you he's a good guy to me he was someone who took advantage of me when I was in a vulnerable situation and when I'm telling you that instead of you listening to me and siding with me you're putting up a wall of defense to, to, to ring fence him from criti criticism. They've and taken his side as yes. soon as they've said that. And I, like, um, the, the crazy thing is, I am more angry mm. with my male friends who didn't stand by me in that situation than I am with the person who assaulted me that night. Because that person's a dog, to be honest. <laughs> and it is what it is, but there were men in that room who claimed to be not all men. Mm. And where were you? Where were you when I needed you? Where were you when you said you were gonna bring me home and instead you left me on my own in a vulnerable situation, never thinking about my safety? And where were you when I told you about what happened and you did nothing? Mm. That's all men. That's the all men that we're talking about. Mm. I think there's also something, um, oh, Sendin loves this, I'm sorry that happened. Um, and there's something so interesting about the conversation when it comes to enabling behaviours for street harassment. Like you will often see groups of men gauding each other on to do that. Um, and how do we how do we move away from that? But how do you get men to pull up their boys if they say something that's a little bit rapey? Because you'll just say it's a little bit rapey, or you'll just say, oh, that was a little bit, but we don't discipline our friends in the way that they need to. And what we end up seeing today is rape culture or rape conversations or the grooming of young women being made into popular culture jokes. So like Duchavelli, for example, he had a huge scandal recently and now it's just a load of memes and TikToks. And that's the impact of what we see. Even like the grooming of young women and the alleged accusations um, with Prince Philip. 
Not Prince Philip. Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew. Oh, sorry. We don't know about <laughs> Prince Philip, but could be. I mean, <laughs> I mean, after that interview, who anyway. knows? Um, but there's that culture has just been enabled to continue and to continue. And I've seen it with like guys who were my friends, and I have a lot of friends who are guys around me. Um, and we have like very honest conversations, exactly like you were saying. I see them in a different space and I see them interacting with their guy friends. And a conversation that always comes up is that, oh, I can't be vulnerable. I can't really say what I really think around like my cis hetero friends. And then I'm like, like male friends. And I'm just like, how do we move if we're too scared to even address the people we hang around, who we say that we love, who we say are our boys or our lads? If we can't pull them up or we'll be like, that, that ain't it. Where, where do we go? I, I, I just don't know. Absolutely. And do you think perhaps this kind of lad banter is a reflection of the toxic masculinity and how it just doesn't help any gender? Because guys might feel like they can't call their friends out, they can't share our mm. stories on their social medias because their friends might then say, oh, that's sad, you're a simp and all this stuff. And it just goes to show that it's to toxic masculinity that doesn't help anyone, which is why we do need to come together and work together to kind of get rid of this. So with that in mind, do any of you feel empathy towards these men who are saying, not all men, I'm not like that? I think I do actually feel a little bit of um, empathy because I feel sad that they don't have the language or the range to be able to tackle this in a different way. Mm. And that is very limiting and it is a shame that they feel like that. But um, unfortunately, women are not the ones to blame for the way that they feel mm. and they need to find different ways to process their emotions. Absolutely. And also like the element of violence in oh, I can't pull up my boy, but I'm going to come and tell you all the horrible things he said about women. That's horrible. Why, why are you telling your like, women friends about that? I didn't need to be offloaded in that way. That's a different type of violence. Um, I do think there is empathy. Like I said, I feel like people need to do a deeper study of themselves in order to understand their emotional world um, before anything can really change. So, yeah, there's empathy there, but... <laughs> Women are dying, lads. Yeah, and, and, and t talking about solutions that are very tangible, men doing a lot more emotional work, yeah. understanding their inner world, connecting with their emotions, processing their emotions, all of that. You know, I always joke that as women, we have constant therapy sessions, right? Mm. We call each other up and we will talk about everything and anything and we'll about unpick it. it and we'll advise. And we do basically therapy for one another constantly. Now, my understanding is men don't have that in the same way. And if you don't, where are you going mm. to get feedback on your own emotions, to understand yourself better, to process information? Where are you going to unpick your feelings? Because you need to do it. It's, it's not like a, an optional thing. And in, in reference to you know, the empathy thing, look, I think ultimately we have to have empathy for everyone and it's hard like radical empathy the idea that <laughs> ultimately you have to dig deep enough to see the humanity in anyone otherwise you're degrading your own humanity yes mm. but with that said um i think the real sad thing in that conversation is i think that a lot of men think that feminism is emasculating to them and that's really sad to me because actually i'll be honest with you as a woman i find nothing as unattractive as a man who like the laddish, completely out of touch with his feelings, desperate to be approved by by his mates. Like mm. <laughs> any day you could take a, you know, swipe the other mm. side. That's not the one. <laughs> but uh, what interestingly, I think that there's like a narrative among men that somehow what we're trying to do is like cut their balls off to make them these like, you know, you know, emasculated men who can't say anything about women, who can't, you know, have to be PC in their WhatsApp chats. And you're just literally just like, oh, no, you can talk about us. Just talk about us as people. With not respect. body parts. Yeah. Just like a just, smidge of respect. Just respect, you know what I mean? I'm not just a pair of boobs, I'm not just an ass. we're not just body parts, we're not to be consumed. You're not supposed to talk about things that you've done to us mm. because there were two of us that we did together. And if you're sharing that information, maybe you want to check with the person that you did that thing with before sharing it with other people. Otherwise, that is disrespectful. Mm. And do we need to educate you about that? Do we need to say to you that maybe you shouldn't share private moments, whether it's pictures, film, or even descriptions of private intimate moments that you shared with a woman? 
Do, yeah. we, do we need to spell that out to you? Because mm. I'll be happy to do it right now, spelling mm. it out. No, Absolutely. don't do it. Respect us enough mm. to have the integrity as a man to respect the interaction that we had. Mm. That interaction, whether it was sexual or otherwise, I am a person deserving of respect in any situation in which you talk about me, mm. including your WhatsApp group. Uh, oh, not the WhatsApp group. Not the WhatsApp group. Um, I think a lot of that behaviour comes from a very low underlying self-esteem or a lack thereof. And I sort of feel like that really needs to be addressed because I think that's in crisis with men. The fact that their self-esteem is so low or it's attached to their accumulation of money or attached to the job and the work that they do. I think men actually need to realise that they too are human in a holistic sense, not just as a provider or not just as a thing or a, um, accumulator of money. When we or move women. from... Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. If we move from there, then we're able to get a better understanding of how we move forward. But men need to do the work, point blank, period. Absolutely. And for me personally, uh, I found it quite interesting. Like, there seems to be a barometer of respect and what kind of women you can give respect to. So mm. I mm. used to pose for topless magazines, so I posed for Nuts and Zoo. And when I shared stuff about feminism or literally sexual assault on my socials, I've had quite a few men saying, well, that's rich coming from you because you used to post for magazines, so you liked it then. And wow. I've tried to explain, well, that's a consent problem mm -hmm. because I've consented to them photographs on a shoot with a contract with an agent doesn't mean that you can then abuse and harass and rape me in the street. So we've had an audience question, which again, I guess, fits into this kind of world of what women do you respect? Of course, it should be all women. But they've asked, what do we think of the industry of porn? Is there a responsibility there when it comes to how they're influencing the way that men treat women, I guess. Yeah, I feel like porn is just another example of where um, what women need from like sexual encounters is not, it doesn't take priority. Even when I think back to like sex ed, we were never, we were never taught about female pleasure. We were never taught about anything besides how you get pregnant or how you avoid that. And um, I think it's just, yeah, it, it perpetuates a lot of problematic views of women. It's very degrading lots of the time. It's very violent. And um, it's not what all women want. So, yeah, I think it does have a lot to answer for. Mm. And I guess on the flip side of that, it is that there is, a, there is a difference between porn, which has been filmed consensually. Obviously, I know there's an issue with some porn that isn't and trafficked, but mm. men, again, it seems like they're trying to shift the blame onto women. Well, it's women in porn, they're, they're doing this, so it makes us feel like that. There's a difference and responsibility, I guess, between knowing that is a fantasy and that has been filmed consensually. A woman walking down the street is a totally different situation and stop trying to shift the blame and look at yourself and you can judge that situation. I mean, I take your point about consent. I think that the problem is Pornhub, right? We're talking about videos that were taken without women's consent. Um, we Even rape videos have appeared on that platform. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not clear on why uh, you lot, you know this, this is public information, and you still use the site. You still enable the people that run the site and you're using that for your pleasure and think that this is fine i mean i i just sometimes it's almost like you live in a parallel universe like i don't understand why this is legit i don't understand why this isn't a problem i don't understand why there isn't a pang of conscience like oh yeah there's something really problematic about this industry and that's without even getting on to the optics of porn which you've touched on which was you know um Sex isn't something you do to us, mm. unless you're like a r really, I mean, you're, are you 14 years old with no clue? <laughs> like, come on, sex isn't something you do to us. This isn't something that, you know, is for you and we have to just avoid getting pregnant, like you pointed out. There is, uh, you know, uh, a, an admiration, a respect, a humility to be displayed in the face of female sexuality and we are nowhere near there. We are nowhere near, you know, the, the, the idea, the kind of, that you, that you find in sort of traditional cultures of the, the kind of goddess female, you know, with, with the, um, whose, whose kind of um, ejaculation is, is a fluid, you know, the elixir of life. Like we're talking about, you know, women's bodies to be 
adored, to be stimulated in various ways through what is a form of adoration. Like, that's the conversation, guys. That's the conversation. We don't want to hear that you banged her. You're like, this is crass and mm. basic. And frankly, I don't know who told you that does something for us, but they lied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. We've got another audience question as well, which I think is something that a lot of men might be wondering after seeing the recent events. And guys are just asking, what can we do? What can men do at street level to make women feel safer? Cross the road. Um, <laughs> it's very simple. Um, I think there are a variety of things that can be done. I think if you feel like someone in front of you fears you, move out of the way because you know that um, you have the element of privilege in that space. Um, Another thing I would also say is maybe, I don't know, stop walking and wait for them to walk past or wherever um, and just take time. But I think that requires people being conscious and not just moving through the go, like on the go. I think there's also a very interesting conversation here when it comes to the way that black men are perceived. Um, and they're often hyper racialized in this space. So you have people moving across um, just because they see a black man. So there's a different, there's another layer of nuance that I think needs to be discussed about when we see black men out at night and the way that the racism is also um, digested as much as the sexism manifests in that way as well. Absolutely. And what I've seen online is some guys saying, well, I shouldn't have to cross the street. You know, wh why should I change my life? Wow. And it's been quite a common thing that I've seen. And again, I think it just come down you know, we're just asking you to be empathetic. And mm -hmm. I think this is what a lot of men are feeling personally attacked. And maybe that we're calling them out. And I guess this is... <laughs> we are. We are <laughs> calling them out. We are. And, and with the, the, you know, the street sexual harassment, I guess these kind of conversations has made a lot of men look at themselves and their past behaviour and think, oh, am I not one of the good guys then? Mm -hmm. and, and also, you know, the behaviour of their friends. Do men have a responsibility to call out the behaviour of their friends in the street, at parties, in WhatsApp chats? Is that how we can start to try and change the narrative and work towards an equal society? I think so. I think that that is really where the work needs to be done. I think people don't often know what sexism is. I think we can really simplify it by thinking about it as, would this person be experiencing it if they were male? If the answer is no, it's sexism. If they are made to feel vulnerable or patronised or like reduced to less than they are, if their safety is compromised, it's sexism. And that can be anything under like a whole host of different behaviours. But if you are complicit, if you are silent in different situations where someone near you is perpetuating that behaviour, you have to help intervene. You have to because you are helping to change the attitudes of so much more, because you are helping right that small wrong, which might be a small wrong, but it will help stop a lot more wrongs in the future. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Absolutely, and not to be that guy, but it also can't just happen, or there can't just be outrage when it happens to white women. It has to happen when it, we have to be outraged by it happening to black women, Asian women, um, women of all backgrounds, um, of all descriptions and all, um, ways of being and looking. It can't just be for the women you find attractive. Um, we really need to deepen our respect for a multiplicity of women because there's also, there's discrepancies where, within sexism, um, which would be further reading, lads. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, there is this thing of, you don't just respect women that you find attractive, you know, that's not supporting women. You have to respect mm. all women. And actually some information has broke whilst we've been talking. Uh, the police have now announced that they will record misogyny as a hate crime moving forward. Mm. No way. Yes. What's your thoughts on that? I didn't think it would happen. But How are they going to describe misogyny is my yeah. question. How do the perpetrators of it write down what it is? And how do we go by a law that is written by the perpetrators for the most part. What women are helping devise what misogyny stands for. In the same way that rape victims, for the most part, are not reporting the, um, their, their attacks, um, I think that this probably will be a case of, like, it, just because the law is in introduced, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will stop. So, mm. yeah. I mean, I, I guess 
yeah, I'm, I'm going to stay cautiously um, on the fence on this one, but because I really genuinely think that I'd much rather hear that we were going to teach emotional intelligence in schools, yeah. that we were going to have much better sex education, that we were going to um, teach, you know, f feminism and, um, you know, a greater awareness of, of and respect for uh, female identities. And, and that's where I think it's going to emanate from, because I think ultimately there is still a dominant perception of women as less capable, less able, um, you know, over, it's, it's a negative underlying perception of femininity. You know, femininity is not respected or admired. Um, and it's, it's not that you should worship at the feet of every woman you cross, although it's a gr great suggestion. But I mean, ultimately what I'm saying is there isn't, um, there isn't an equal respect for what we bring to the table as women. Um, and until there is, and I think that's educational, uh, we will continue to see attitudes among men that will be problematic. You said, you know, what can men do? And people are objecting to, to crossing the street. I mean, what mm -hmm. does that cost you? Do you know what we have to do before, before we go on a night out? We pack something so that we can defend ourselves, you know, whether it's hairspray or a lemon juice or an you know an alarm mm -hmm. we um plan our routes we warn people about where we're going and where we're going to be we think all of that through really well we never let go of our drinks because if we do somebody might date rape us mm -hmm. we think about what we wear we think about who we're going to be with think about how we're going to get home and you can't cross the street mm -hmm. really I think there's also a really important point about how we um, raise children differently, dependent on gender. That needs to stop. Mm. I think there's a lot of like very toxic narratives that come into that that mean that women are told to um, protect themselves. Like my parents put me through kickboxing so that if there was anything that I needed, I'd be able to defend myself. I then used to run um, defense workshops after that. But like we're always putting the onus on women instead of asking men to just cross the road or to, I don't know, not abuse women. I don't know, listen to women. I don't know, read even. I think a question I've been thinking about a lot recently is when I ask men, the books that you're reading or the knowledge and the content you're consuming, is any of it by women? Correct. I 100% agree with you. Zero. And it will all be like the 42 laws of power yeah. or like all these books that are like so overtly alpha. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with alpha or beta or whatever. But like if you're only taking in that knowledge, you're not going to get a whole rounded um, perspective of anything. But you're also not going to be able to respect women because you don't even respect them enough to take in their content or to listen to their voices or to even have that as a dialogue or a conversation that is in your mental or within your sphere. Um, so I think that we need to start Absolutely. There. And like Jordan Peterson, a lot of men read his books and go to his events mm. and engage in them kind of conversations. And it's like, why are you not engaging with women it's an why do you not want to listen mm. to women because yeah. it's perceived as a sign of weakness i mm. genuinely th think that it's like men see themselves as like in a separate sphere like there's the there's the man's masculine world and then you know it p potentially women can exist within that world like we might be allowed a little space in there like the little feminine space but you're not allowed to infect the men's world with your mm. femininity because that would be weakness Whereas what they don't realize is something that Alia had mentioned earlier on, which is that all of us are a balance of masculine and feminine. Mm. And that currently in our culture, I think a lot of men are very imbalanced and Absolutely. that they're convinced that the hyper masculinity is somehow attractive or a sign of strength. And the truth is that there is nothing more attractive to a balanced woman than a balanced man and that means being mm. connected to both sides of who you are and there's also the fact that male suicide is extremely high and a lot of the time when we see that it's tied to there being a perception of having to be the man having to be macho yeah. not being able to express your feelings so we're actually seeing it kill men as well so no one's benefiting my g like no, no. one 
And so when do we start having that conversation of looking in the inner world, socialising boys to not repress or fear their own emotions and not teaching girls to defend themselves or have to be so ready to defend themselves? When do we just let children be children? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think there's the thing in we say to men or oh, boys, young children, it's like, man up, don't do that, don't act like a woman. It's like being a woman is the worst thing possible thing, yeah. that they could do. So yeah. from a young age, we're installing that in them. You know, this is a huge societal change that needs to happen. It's not mm -hmm. something, and of course the recent events has sparked this kind of conversation, which is great. But for us women, mm -hmm. we've been having these conversations for years and trying to get through and nothing is changing. And I don't know about you guys, but I just feel like I'm, banging my head against a wall and, and shouting into a black hole because all I met with is not all men. I don't do that, but someone's doing it mm. because things aren't changing and, and they need to. Yeah, absolutely. Agree, yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. So unfortunately that is all we've got time for. So thank you for joining thank me you. on the panel. Thank you. And thank you to everyone as well for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Give yourself a hand, ladies. <laughs> oh, can I say one last thing? Should. Sure. Sorry. Um, every man needs to read the work of Bell Hooks. If you're not reading Bell Hooks, we can't have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I uh, can be, actually, would it be helpful? Like can a... we go around and suggest one, just even just yeah. one book? So, for, for example, for me, I'd love to suggest a book called Sensuous Knowledge, um, an African feminist perspective for everyone. Um, and the reason I'm suggesting that is that I think it's a book that uh, men wouldn't conceive of as being a book that they should read or that's designed for them yeah. but it's actually all about accepting that we have something to contribute to the conversation about who we are as a society as a culture we're not like a little subculture thing over here like we are equal parts of the culture and so you might want to get acquainted with how some of us think about the world because it will ultimately enrich your outlook. And ultimately, I think it'll just make conversations so much easier. Mm. Mm. Maxi? Um, I mean, it's not out yet, but my friend has a book coming out this September called The Transgender Issue. It's by Sean Fay. And as a trans woman, I feel like I feel more men need to be engaging themselves with these, uh, with these conversations about trans women as well. There needs to be an equal level of respect. And um, 350 trans people were murdered in last year and 98% of those people were women. So, and one of them was someone that I know. So that needs to change. Absolutely. Educate yourselves. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, yeah, the thirst needs to be for knowledge, not just tits and ass. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the two books that I would say are All About Love by Bell Hooks and The Will to Change, Men Love and Masculinity. Every male my guy friend who I've given this book to has just, lost their mind in a good way they've just been like i everything that they're saying about my emotional world is on this pe is on this page everything that i've always felt and not been able to say is in this book so i would definitely recommend everyone go and read the will to change by bell hooks absolutely well thank you so much ladies for joining me thank you. thanks thank you okay now we can do it <laughs> <laughs>